Michael Hernandez for MLH Uncensored. Cannot wait to get to speak to you all for the second episode here today. It was an absolute pleasure getting to speak to Dimitri Gorgidis and Bedtime MMA in that first episode. Got to hear a lot about both of them and just overall getting to hear their journeys into the MMA sport was an awesome experience. So I want to thank everybody for the, first, the support on that first episode. I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel almost at 400 subscribers so that's a pretty big marker just want to go ahead and kick off the video with some positivity and just really say how appreciative i am for that opportunity and not only for that but for you guys to be able to stick around and watch me in these videos and in these interviews so i really want to take that time thank everybody on the channel that has been supporting and that continues to support as we now look into episode two mr sky Shin jones for endo for you know mixed martial artist over there looking to possibly go into the professional rankings here pretty soon possibly looks to have another amateur fight on december 14th over there at the fight night in the san jose area Texas U arena to be exact going to be speaking to him but on top of that also going to be speaking to mr jack Hermauer, the one and know professional who got his first ever win at the first fight night at the tech in san jose so going to be speaking to him overall i like to call this the fight night at the tech kind of takeover because both Sky Shun and Mr. Jackson Hermauer were both on that card together, obviously facing both separate opponents, but it's still pretty cool that they were able to join the program here today. Had a lot happening in the UFC this past weekend and possibly some big fights coming up over here at UFC Apex 98. But I think the first thing that we have to really talk about is UFC 307. And where that kind of leaves us going forward. So I really, really am going to be honest with you all. Not able to catch the main card for this one. And it was so painful for me to be able to not only have to sit through all, like, I swear it felt like a million people. There's probably only like four or five people that actually texted me that said that this fight was just an all-time classic. I am so hurt that I didn't get to watch this. I really, truly love the story of Khalil Roundtree, I mean, somebody that battled back from depressive episodes and anxiety and losing his father at a very early age, and then going on to have a successful MMA career after being in the UFC for quite some time. I mean, he entered when I believe he still had a single digit record. And then you have the likes of Alex Pereira right across from somebody that also entered the UFC on a single digit record, but maybe on a little bit of a different type of trajectory, was able to achieve double champ status within, I believe, his first I mean, he still hasn't even fought 10 times in the UFC, which is absolutely crazy to think about. Khalil Roundtree, Alex Pereira went to war for four rounds. Alex Pereira pulling out the victory over there. But let's look over this whole entire card because, man, I just feel like this was one card that, I mean, I know that there was some, and we will talk about the stinkers on this card. Just not give credit to who was on this card and who put on some great performances. Let's go ahead and talk about it a little bit and really just get into it here. Start off at the early prelims. I mean, you had Ryan Spann and Tisha Pennington earning some big wins in their career. Ryan Spann and Tisha Pennington both coming off of some kind of, you know, off and on trajectories. I mean, a lot of people would argue that Tisha won that last fight against Tabitha Ricci. I wouldn't say that she won that last fight, but I can definitely see the argument that you're bringing to the table with that one. She was able to get the win over the retiring Carla Esparza. Ryan Span, of course, getting the win over OSP to end off those early prelims. He got that guillotine choke in. He called it, uh, I believe he called it the Span guillotine, the Superman choke, something like that. And I think that perfectly fits in, but very surprised that he was actually able to get that off on OSP. I mean, many people know of OSP's grappling prowess and he i mean he's i know jason von flu originator of the von flu choke but osp has taken it into a right of his own and has truly kind of adopted it and really put it into his own arsenal to where people have been able to associate him with that so just crazy to see him losing via guillotine and i mean you live by the guillotine you die by the guillotine sometimes and i guess both these gentlemen live by both of those statements because Ryan Span was able to not only finish the fight by guillotine but osp his traditional setup for that classic osp choke is of course through when someone is shooting that guillotine so i was very surprised to not see osp be able to execute that but i mean ryan span just had that right underneath the chin he had it tight and he was able to go ahead and get that tap was not able to catch the matchup between Caesar Almeida and Ehor Pretoria, but I was 
in form that it was not the best refereed uh you know they uh may have had some uh, questionable refereeing jobs but there a lot of these prelims i was a, a little bit in and out i actually did recently start my new job that i'm currently working at just to go ahead and earn some money for of course me being in school and possibly looking to like how i said mentioned that previously aforementioned going into a master's program so you know in terms of being able to watch all the fights that i want to not able to but the one fight that i did really want to highlight on this early prelim or on this prelim card was joaquin buckley earning the win over stephen thompson i mean if you had a fighter to choose on the card who has just made a rise like no other is i gotta say joaquin buckley i mean not only was he able to get that win against russo boy in his hometown over there in st louis but then you have somebody like joaquin buckley who's lost in the ufc to i mean walking buckley isn't just some guy that i, I know fans are going to get this interpretation of him now because he's gotten the wins over ruse boy he's got the wins over josh Rams. he's gotten a couple of wins now underneath his belt in a row but it's just when josh the walking buckley was not having the earth, easiest go of it and i know he has the Impa, um Impa ko as well you know that a lot of people highlight that onto throw that onto his resume but i mean Joaquin Buckley, especially after the Boya fight had the Conor McGregor call out, people were looking at him really sideways going into this one, especially in terms of his stock and where it was going to go. And I think that win over Stephen Thompson not only put Joaquin Buckley in possibly a new trajectory in that welterweight division, but he may get that fight call out that he after he, that he was uh, wanting so so badly in the cage after the win against Stephen Thompson and just the beautiful way to go ahead and set it up Thompson was pressuring Thompson and just using that wrestling and was able to get that right hand across and utilize kind of Thompson's own weapon against him in terms of the footwork and being able to move in and out and luckily just an overall great win for him and he did really well in this fight I just overall I know that Thompson had some, you know, he's always pretty good at getting up from the takedowns. But, I mean, Buckley was forcing the pressure with the takedowns as well. I mean, he was four for seven on the ground. I know Thompson got some, you know, Thompson got some licks in as well. But I would say an overall pretty pretty good performance from Joaquin Buckley. And now you look at Stephen Thompson, and I look, he think they may make Stephen Thompson end up taking on the likes of maybe uh colby covington if he's interested in that fight i know uh, my shout out my guy bedtime mma he's been pushing for that one for a long time but for stephen thompson and mr colby covington but i think honestly that may be the fight to make right now i mean you have colby coming off an injury you know he wants to fight somebody that is predominantly a striker that he's going to be able to take to the ground with ease stephen thompson has seemed to give up a lot of takedowns maybe not has let their his opponents be effective offset takedowns but definitely would be an interesting matchup to oversee and McColby coming off the loss to Leon possibly looking to jump start his career back in the welterweight division get that time that time to go ahead and get that title shot before he ends up calling it a career and hanging up those gloves so I mean and who knows especially with the way the team FC has been uh very let's just say gracious in terms of giving Colby Covington his shot at the title and now this main card sadly i'm not going to be able to speak on much of this main card besides for a couple of fights now roman delite kevin holland i was able to watch this one completion let me just say if you are someone that has been talking shit or has been saying that kevin holland is a weak kevin holland's not game he doesn't want to fight he's a pussy whatever you have been saying because i know that the whole jury has been out on kevin holland supposedly and how much he sucks and yada 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 oh he gives up on fights and this do you not realize the pain and the discomfort of a broken rib like i get he gets paid to get in there and do his thing and so on and so forth and you know what you have that respect as a fan paying for the pay-per-view to want those guys to go in there and perform but to call a guy these names and to just go after him maliciously like how so many of these people are doing and this is not even a a love letter quote unquote to kevin holland to try and get him and this is just more me speaking from a humanitarian standpoint it's just absolutely crazy that people bet money on a sport like mma that is so unpredictable and then proceed to get upset at the fact that their said bet does not win or that their said person that they told their friends was going to win doesn't win like the fact that kevin holland has to come out and like reply to guys like that 
I mean, I understand maybe talking about the injury, talking about, you know, how he was feeling in there. But to go ahead and respond to all these people saying that you basically quit on yourself in there when we all know Kevin Holland is nothing. But, I mean, maybe he may not be the most, quote unquote, you know, traditional guy. I know he has his takes about the title. He has his takes about how he looks at the UFC and fighting. You can't say that Kevin Holland isn't down to fight. I mean, this guy was one of the most active fighters during 2020 and so on and during these years following and now looking behind us i just wonder how much this is going to affect the activity we see from kevin holland going forward are we going to continue to see kevin holland fighting four times a year like how we we've been used to seeing him these past couple of years and it's not so much to do with the injury but it's more to do with the fact that kevin holland has been getting a little bit dinged up in a lot of these matchups and i know he's a tough guy i know he's the trailblazer as he likes to call himself but definitely wishing the best and speediest recovery for my man over there out of houston texas but now take it over to the co-main event was actually able to catch a couple of glimpses of this one and sadly there was not much for me to catch but I was able to catch when pena was knocked down and let me just tell you, as someone that even I wasn't tuning into the whole 25-minute matchup, I just do not see where Pena won this fight. Like, I cannot see it. And I I mean, I've watched a good amount of this fight. Actually, funny enough, was able to catch it on my last break over there at my job that I was just mentioning. And it just, it's crazy to me watching that fight when I was watching it. And then, you know, getting off or, you know, checking my phone and, seeing the fact that Juliana Pena not only won, but I could be wrong by this, she may have won by unanimous decision. What? Like, that's all I got to say towards that. What? That's just, it's wild. To me. It's absolutely crazy. And, I mean, we obviously, we've been talking about this Alex Pereira, Khalil Roundtree, just an absolutely amazing showmanship between these two guys. And I was sadly not able to watch this matchup live, but I've been able to watch a couple of the highlights. And man, these guys are putting it on each other and just really emptying the gas can. You got to give it up to Khalil Roundtree, man. I know that everybody's been saying that this weekend, but his stock, just like, I mean, another gentleman on this card, Joaquin Buckley, is just exponentially risen, just gone over the roof. So... Congratulations to, I mean, not only Joaquin Buckley, for, but Khalil Roundtree. I know that may sound a little bit weird to say congratulations knowing that he lost it. But, dude, the way that you win it, that way that Khalil went in there, like, uh, not often do you say that a UFC fighter or a athlete in many respects gave it all they had. And you can truly say that this man, Khalil, went in there and gave every ounce that he had not only for us as fans but for himself and that's something that i just uh, i gotta give credit to not only as a person but as a human being as a man as as a, as a fight fan um it's just it's insane to think that he was in there and just i mean some of the damage that he was withstanding in those third and fourth rounds when alex was turning it on was just so so hard to watch at some points i mean it was like a car crash just twisted metal and just i mean i think ariel hawani he, he had mentioned it too while he was talking on his show it's like you know oftentimes people don't like to say violence but man that was just some it was like watching poetry and then at the same time throwing some blood on that little little quill it was insanity and uh, the fact that i haven't even got to watch it yet and i'm saying that i think should go and speak magnitude about it that's just me watching the fight highlights and being able to decipher from what the fight was like based off of that i mean i, I can't wait until this fight gets uploaded on espn i'm probably gonna watch this going to bed you know i may watch this i may watch watch this bring it over bring it over my next date like this is this is the ufc fan getter right here this is what the ufc i think really really wanted with this matchup i know they were facing a lot of criticism with this booking going into it but i think this was like perfect scenario for the ufc in terms of main event and obviously huge huge recoveries and prayers to khalil roundtree along with alex Pereira, who was dealing with some sicknesses and some illnesses in the lead up to this one so truly want to give my just overall well wishes to both of those gentlemen 
and just really wishing the best for them going forward and i mean you got to give them a vacation like no give them some time off three six months just let the body rest i know alex is going to want to try and probably hop back in there like for christmas or something or you know he's a he's a crazy man but i mean you really gotta you really just gotta let them take a break especially for a guy like alex who has already fought i mean three times this year you know he had 300 he had 303 and now he has this fight and he has just been able to not only win but has been able to knock out all three of those guys and one of those fights obviously going a pretty pretty far distance over there when he was able to take on mr roundtree over there in salt lake city this past weekend so i definitely think it is time for poetan to go ahead and take a break actually rocking that full violence poetan gear as we speak take this one into our interview section for today I really, really appreciate all your guys tuning in and overall just your comments about these past couple of interviews, anything that you guys want to say in terms of feedback. If you guys love the videos and you guys are, you know, wanting some guests, comment down below. Like I truly do love to hear any type of just any type of like commentary on my on my videos to commentary on fights. Like if you watch the fight and you really want me to talk about it, comment down below. I truly am really interested in hearing what all the fans have to say we now look to take it into mr skyshin jones for this interview michael hernandez here mlh media once again here for mlh media uncensored here with skyshin the limit jones over there bay area california how you doing today my brother i'm doing good you know can't complain another day just uh another day in the life <laughs> Hey, funny enough, I was actually just getting to speak with your, I mean, I would kind of say your mentor over there, El Jefe, as they like to call him, Gilbert Melendez. He was getting to speak to about a couple of guys, a couple of prospects that he's really been keeping an eye on. And you were one of those gentlemen that he mentioned and kind of said, hey, you know, I know he's been a little bit more on the underneath. You know, you've been kind of kept under the covers, so to speak. But you have a 4-0 MMA record now. Amateurs, you've been able to definitely go out there and perform against some of the top talent. And mind you, I kind of found it interesting with this last fight, and this is part of the question as well, was there a big reason for wanting to make that quick jump in competition to go against a guy like Moses Gomez, who had so many fights already on his record? It's like this game, the more you understand it, you know, I'm lucky to have... Um, the people in my corner that I do, I get a lot of game. I get a lot of backstory. You know, this game don't have a blueprint, but, you know, you can always take bits and pieces from everybody. And uh, some from our faction of just everybody, I feel like that uh, we come in with the mentality that, you know, we're going to take the fights that we need to take and we're going to take the risk that we need to take in order to keep leveling up, keep moving, moving up. So I wasn't, you could ask Gil, when the fight was announced to me, I was ready for everything because <clears throat> it's just like, you got to be ready. I'm on a big stage. I get to showcase why I'm here. And I've been telling people that since I started, I want to show why I'm here, why I'm worth the money, why I'm worth the eyes is because I come out here and I, proceed to do ninja shit so you were able to throw out one of the most like interesting kind of sequences of strikes that was put on display that whole entire night i gil had it uh spoke it best he said that sweet chain music you were kind of able to tap into your inner Shawn michaels can you go into is that something that is just constantly being trained at in the gym that kind of that spontaneous type of flow because I feel like there's a lot of guys out there that don't really have that when it comes to fighting because that's something that definitely is a lot more of a natural take. It's not something you can truly train in the gym. It's something that kind of just comes out of you and it came out of the limit um, come uh, the first fight night at the Tech. It's kind of like crazy because, you know, in the gym, you just sometimes you try different techniques. You do different things that, you know, in a fight you might not be able to use, but I have a lot of tricks in my back pocket and I was, uh, I had the ability to um, take notice to the tendencies that he was uh, bringing forth in the fight. And I would notice in between pauses, he would wait for me 
and he would take that opportunity to go for his shot. So um, I have great Muay Thai teachers. Uh, my coach, BB, uh, at the time I was working with Coach Ahn, uh, two respectable uh, Muay Thai fighters, trainers, just, you know, we got we got a good stable of people. And uh, what I remember that whole that whole time, even when I was in the back, I remember, all right, don't just give them one thing. You got to show them several things and it's going to open up your, your whole game. And, uh, yeah, that happened like the first 30 seconds of the fight. And, you know, it, it, I think it set the tone. So I don't come to play. I come to fight, and, you know, I think that's our, our whole mentality. If you're not coming to fight, you're in the wrong sport, buddy, you know? You definitely are part of that. Uh, I, I was talking with the with Gil about it yesterday on that call, and it's just that new wave of kind of barrier fighters where you guys are really just, I mean, game to kind of take anyone on anywhere. It doesn't really, you guys aren't looking at this, how I, I often compare an MMA where you have guys that are kind of, easing their way in you know they're taking the easiest fights that they can to try and basically taking the shortcut route and you guys do not believe in that over there in the bay area over there with the scrap pack team can you kind of go into the origins of joining over there and really truly your mma base because i think that's what maybe a lot of fans would possibly be interested in in this call here today is to hear a little bit more about how the limit got to this level and got to possibly looming and looking at a professional start here possibly in 2025 if you keep on this uh great trajectory here in the in your amateur career yeah um it's actually crazy so they call me a grappler but you know i like to strike i like to keep the fight standing i like to keep <laughs> you know at least me in there that's where I, I get the enjoyment i love grappling i started with grappling um i started training at 10th planet oakland under uh michael hillybrand um, he's, uh, Danny, uh, Denny Prohaska's, uh, black belt. He trained under him and I trained and it was right after pandemic. So I was just like trying, trying to find something to do in the sense of like, okay, I know I'm a competitor. I know I have something to offer and, um, I want to go out there and test myself. And, um, I called Michael and I was like, it was crazy just shit ever like you know I just call him I'm like hey you know I'm looking for a jiu-jitsu gym and I'm trying to be a UFC world champion uh can I come here like what do y'all offer and um I come in I do jiu-jitsu I get promoted to blue belt in eight months and um I built the base I know it was important and I'll tell anybody that comes into the sport I feel like jiu-jitsu should be a starting base because before you can handle the stand-up war you got to be able to handle the ground or else you're an incomplete fighter and i think with mma it's in the name you a mixed martial artist i do everything i don't care about oh i'm better at this better than everybody i always get those questions like what do you trick like train everything because that's important so start training then Mike goes way back because this, this is way before me. Like, this is like, this has been like decades of people having connections and people training together. So he opened up the door to me because he used to train with Gil and he contacted him and said, oh, we got this. I have this guy. He has potential. He's a hard worker. He does what he needs to do. And he's trying to be an MMA fighter. So my introduction in the MMA is I get 30 minute roll time with Jake Shields and get demolished <laughs> the whole time, you know? So, and I'm just crazy. Cause I'm like, okay, it happened, but I, I keep coming back. So there's like a, a point where it's like, I'm doing this. Cause I think that a lot of people forget that too. Like fighters are human and, we got to have the ability to like understand why we're doing what we're doing. Just like anybody else, you got to make a purpose of it. And I'm like, okay, what does this mean to you? And it's been like that ever since I started, I got uh, multiple opportunities to like learn, just get knowledge from everybody. And then after that, I start training with Gil and I start (laughs) 
you know, training with a uh, uh, Hyder Emil, the Hurricane. I start training with all the guys over at El Nino. And, you know, it teach you with us, you have to earn your keep. You have to show them that you're dedicated. It's not like a place where you could just like everybody is welcome. Don't get me wrong. But and I feel like and that's for everybody in this sport, because at the end of the day, you fight and prove that what you say is not just some baloney and <laughs> show that you're the best fighter, you know? Oh, no, no, you're good. I was going to bring up, there's so much to unpack from that question. I mean, down from the connection with Danny Pro, uh, Prokopos over there, I know he's obviously one of the first uh, 10th Planet Black Belts underneath uh, Eddie Bravo over there out of the 10th Planet system, and then you obviously got... Uh, Gilbert Melendez, obviously, huge connection over there to be able to connect with your coach uh, Hildebrandt from 10th Planet Oakland, and then now being able to relay it all back. But I caught a little bit of the fact that you got to roll with Mr. Jake Shields, the king of the king of Nogi, and somebody that's obviously a huge, huge partner in terms of getting the scrap pack going and just getting Gil into MMA. How is that to get to roll with? Uh, I mean, a MMA legend, but I would say a Nogi and a Jiu Jitsu legend as well. Uh, it was like, it was surreal because uh, I've always been a fan of MMA. You know, I've always known to fight and I grew up watching fights. Me and my dad, that was like our bonding experience. You know, we used to play like UFC uh, 3 all the time and he would pick Rashad Evans and I would pick Shogun Hua, you know, and I used to whoop him all the time. And um, so I've always known about fighting. So to be able to come into the game and just like have like really somebody that's a decorated like living legend, that's important to me because I didn't get into this sport to be with just like, you know, you 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 strive for the, the best. So I didn't come into this game to like, I, I want the legends to be at my table because one day I want to be regarded as somebody in my own right you know, in your own right. I think everybody, a lot of fighters are legends. It's just some people know and some people don't know, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's two sides to everything. Like, you know, then you start going deeper and like going back in the day, like you got fighters like Crazy Horse, you know, you got, you got all these fighters from Pride like, you talk about Fedor nowadays, you talk about uh, Mirko Krokop, you talk about all the guys from, like, UFC 1, you got to do your research. You can't just get into this sport. And, of course, it's like, you know, as a fan, you want to know the now. But I feel like, especially with mixed martial arts, because mixed martial arts is a lineage, you got to look back and pay respects to the people that came before you. Because they did it when wasn't nothing being offered they just yeah so now it's it's our purpose as the new generation to go out here and actually fight you know so and i want i want the respect of the people that came before me so i'm gonna go out there and fight my heart out keep kicking dudes in the face <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> and you're over there now, Fight Night at the Tech 2, being able to perform in that ring again. And much like how you were mentioning with those kind of pride roots, you, you got the you got the ring, you got the whole dark energy in the... I mean, I wouldn't say dark energy, but you got the dark room. It's very... It's the, the lighting in there. It's, it reminds you, and Gil said it as well, it reminds you so much of that old timeliness of MMA. And you go into how it was to perform in that arena and to get to perform in that environment and how you're possibly looking forward to get to make that same jump once again on December 14th, because I mean, like how you stated, it's great to have that lineage and have that connection to recognize that and being able to perform on a stage where you're able to put that up in the biggest platform. It must be pretty special. Oh yeah. This, this like history, you know, I was part of the inaugural event. No matter what anybody say, can't nobody take that away from me. I was on the inaugural event of the new age of just Bay Area mixed martial arts. And um, to have the privilege to, to fight on that card, it was just like a blessing come true. Because, you know, manifestation is a real thing. I always told myself, you're going to fight in the arena. 
you ain't got to worry about that. And, you know, with the talent and the hard work and the blood, sweat, and tears, I went out there and performed to the best of my abilities, which I continue to do December 14th. You know, um, I like to use the phrase, just because you don't see it don't mean it ain't happening. So, you know, I'm ready for anything. I've been ready. Um, and that's that's how I feel about it. Is there anybody that you're possibly looking at to have a projected matchup with? I know that you've been someone that's liked to stay in that lightweight region and possibly, you know, kind of making your realm into the 160 and nearing the welterweight. I know that jump from 155 to 170 is a little bit uh, a little bit heavier, obviously. But what has there been any exploration on possibly moving down a weight class or, or moving around a little bit, especially now that you're still in your amateur career and still trying to figure things out? I'm a lightweight. I think we're going to keep it there. And um, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, I don't know about I don't, I don't care. I don't care about, it. like, like really, like, you know, I'm still in the amateur scene. So whoever they put in front of me, I see it as experience. You know, it is what it is. Whatever going to happen on that night is going to happen regardless. You know? Yeah, the other so, guy across from me could be weighing 200 pounds for all you care in, in your eyes, right? Exactly. It's just like I'm not going to be out here just. Please give me this guy. Just, oh, my <laughs> God. This guy right here. I want, you know, but I do want to take the fights that's meant for me and, you know, put on a good fight. That's that's what we come for. As a fan, that's what y'all want to see. I want to see scrapping. So December 14th, that's what I expect to do. And I'm going to be in there uh, a warrior, a gladiator on the stage that represents what I believe in, in a sense, you know. So it's like. They do it right. They do it right for fighters. You're going to be able to be on that stage, not only with yourself and with your other scrapback teammates, but like how Gil made the announcement yesterday, Antonio Vasca is going to be making his professional debut. You got Kyle Clark as well on the card making his professional debut. What does it mean for you to have those teammates alongside you on that card making their professional debuts and possibly going into a scene that you're looking to embark to as well in terms of the professional mixed martial arts world? Antonio, dog, <laughs> Kyle, dog, you know, we, we, we just building up. We, we just working. We just working, you know, and I think if you ain't, this is your test to show that you meant to be there. And I have no doubt in my mind that when all of us make the jump and uh, do what we need to do, we're going to we going to uh, rise up to the occasion. You know, work, work outbeat everything. So, you know, when you have that mindset and confidence and just work ethic and no quit, then uh, you're unstoppable. And you got to believe it, especially in this game. You got to believe it when nobody else do. So I ain't got no just dogs, dogs. <laughs> And living up to that testament of being a dog, and I mean, he's just kind of been a true. I know you've had the guys of the guys guidings of Nate Diaz, and of course the rest of the Scrap Pack members to be able to go through and kind of show you guys the ropes of how it is to get into that UFC scene, how it is to build your name and to build your brand. But now you got Hyder Mill over there, who's I know he's alongside kind of very close friends with Raul Rosas, but he has built himself up in a brand that's separated from himself from Raul and just kind of really built himself in his own right and has truly built his own kind of hurricane brand and just his own sensation. What if you had to think about Hyder and Mill's career as being someone that's been in the room within and like how you said, been training a lot with Mr. Hurricane Hyder and Mill? <laughs> nah, uh, Hyder man, proud of my dog. He been working hard, and he been showing people, you know, what it means to like be a true mixed martial artist, to be a true ninja. And and I think that um, he where he belong. You know, he's meant for the big show. He he's had countless battles, and he's fought through adversity, and he's a warrior. Especially we look at it, at least for me. As one of the young guys coming up, you got to have that camaraderie, especially with the dude that's the guy, you know. And uh, I'm happy for Hyder. He's in the place where he needs to be. And uh, training with him, I've trained with him since I came in. And, you know, um, I think it, it speaks bounds because you need that push. You need to have somebody who's 
like levels, you know, there's levels to this game and you need to have that. And um, Hyder's helped me with um, pretty much all of my camps. He's a, um, he's a true guy at heart and um, yeah, he a warrior and you can't do nothing but respect it. Still undefeated. More you know what? That he definitely is. And much like yourself, a lot of you gentlemen and a lot of you, just overall the scrap pack has always been must watch TV, a new era of that being in season now with Sky Shin Jones, Hyder Mill, Antonio Vasquez. So many great fighters coming over there out of the scrap pack. But Mr. Sky Shin Jones, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about in this call? I know that you have had a lot of people that have been in support of your MMA career, especially in the lead up to your last matchup on May 18th, 2024. Didn't get the opportunity to quite say it in front of everybody in front of the Texas U arena, but has there been anybody in particular that has really been adding to this MMA journey and has really been helping support you now that you are getting, now that you're getting a little bit deeper into this thing? Um... You know, I, I want to shout out um, everybody. Um, um, just Gil, Carrie, giving the guys the opportunity. They the, they the runners, front runners of this. So just giving us the ability to, like, train and just, you know, you got to take that into account. But just everybody, my boxing coach, my coach, uh, Coach Hiro, uh, Coach Escobar, um, I, my Muay Thai coaches, Coach BB, Coach John, um, Jiu Jitsu coach, uh, just everybody really, even the ones outside of it, you know, like shout out to my boy Jordan, um, Albert, shout out Albert, best hands in the business. Um, there's just a lot of people, and um, I just want to say thank you to all of them. And, you know, the love you see, you see the love, especially when people can tell that you're authentic. I think authentic love is better than some, uh, you know, fabricated love. So, you know, you know, everybody, everybody is is good. <laughs> you you know, you in support, and this the Bay Area, so it's an army, and uh, it's just gonna keep growing, keep getting bigger. We trying to do big things out here, even bring it to the Chase Center one day. So, you know. that would. That would be absolutely insane. And it's still a shocker to me that the UFC has not done a show at the Chase Center. Am I right? I feel like that's that's something that's waiting to happen. Chase Center, it's right, it's right there on the bay line. I know San Francisco has its problems, but come on, man. Like that's such an opportunity right there that they're missing out on. And you got Hyder and Mill, UFC fight night. Like, come on. What are they thinking? Yeah. It's craziness. The craziness, UFC, man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, they need to do it. It's a big market. Uh, 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 but you know, can't ever. You don't know what Dana. I don't know what Dana thinking. But <laughs> Noche was beautiful though. I I love Noche. It was a a, a good uh, event to highlight a culture, and uh, I loved the presentation. Like that was that was one of one, and I respected that. But yeah, you got to show the Barry some love. There are too many too much history out here not to show love. And you got the Chase Center. Man, it's all good. Give me Patty Pimblet. I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think even too, like, I mean, the fact that we have only hit Anaheim in 2024 in California is just remarkable, remarkable to me. Especially like besides, like, let's take away the barrier. And I know that's a crazy thing to say. You still have Sacramento, which is, I mean, yeah. obviously Team Alpha Male Hub over there, but so the fact that there's no shows in Northern California, it just it's it's sickening. It's, it's crazy to me, that especially with like how you said the MMA roots that are on over there, and now a lot of you guys are now making this jump. It's just it's crazy that the UFC has not made that uh, trajectory. But is there a possibility that we would ever get to see Mr. Sky Shin Jones making his way over there to the UFC? And if that was the chance, and if that was the possibility. Where would you possibly want to make that debut? I know that a lot of guys, they, they say, hey, I don't care, throw me in the apex, throw me in whatever, but it must be pretty special if you had the chance to be able to pick where you were going to be able to fight for that first time. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have no doubt if I stay on the track and do keep doing what I've been doing, keep producing the work that I've been producing, then I have no doubt I'm being in the UFC. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be like a homecoming. Just uh, everybody pop out, you know, that would, that would be a fun fight for the Bay Area, just, like, to experience that, bring 
bring the UFC home, bring the big show home and go out here and have a memorable fight for everybody. Uh, you know, Hyder in the race right now. They they need to do that right now for Hyde and uh because he represented the Bay Area. Not a lot, of, you know, people come out here, hit a 38 punch combination real quick, <laughs> and then bounce out. <laughs> No, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm, there's not a lot of guys that are doing that. So that's definitely where uh, I think we need to give a little highlight to him and maybe throw a little on that card as well. I mean, that was someone that was over there in the in the Northern California area as well for a long time training with uh, NorCal Fight Alliance. David Terrell, obviously huge friend of the Scrap Pack team over there. So I just feel like it's only right to be able to make that return and possibly, I know you call yourself the limit, but no limits on Mr. Skyshin Jones' approach and dreams as he looks forward into his MMA career. Skyshin, any last comments that you want to close off the call with here today? Yeah, uh, make sure to tune in December 14th, Text to You Arena, San Jose. Uh, appreciate everybody for the support. And uh, thank you, Michael, for having me on the uh, show. And uh, yeah, it's time to get back to work. Appreciative of your time, my brother, Michael Hernandez, MLH Media, over here for MLH Media Uncensored. And we're going to be signing off with the Limit 510, Mr. Skyshin Jones, over there out of the Bay Area in California. A great time getting to speak to Skyshin there. It's always a pleasure to get to speak to any of the guys over there at the Scrap Pack and the San Francisco area. And possibly looking to have his second matchup over there. It's Mr. Skyshin Jones in San Jose. But... Another one of my guests now that is coming up on the program, Jackson Hermauer, climbed to 1-0 and against Gavin Hallinan over there at Fight Night at Tech 1 in May. And now coming on the program, speaks a little bit about his teammate and partnership with Jake Woodley, along with also, you know, being, being there for Bellator Championship Series when his teammate Jordan Newman over there at Rufus Sport was able to get the victory. So, a lot of things that we got to discuss. We also got to discuss the possibility of Fresno State rejoining the Pac-12 and adding a wrestling program with their news that they have joined the Pac-12. Former collegiate D1 wrestler, the likes of Jackson Hermauer. Really hope y'all love this interview. Can't wait to see you guys on the other side. Michael Hernandez here, MLH Media, and we are back today. I cannot wait to get into this one, man. Always a fun guest to have on the program. Jackson Huncho Hermauer, one of the, I mean, I would say top prospects in terms of potential and who he has been just training with and getting on the match with. My man, Jackson Hermauer, how's it going today, brother? Good, brother. Good. Good to see you. Always a great pleasure to get to see you. Last time I got to see you, we were out over there partying out in the streets of San Jose like wild animals, man, you know, just having a grand old time. How has everything been? since then and you know i mean jordan newman he even had his fight over there at bellator in the meantime we've we've been we've been uh we've been due for this yeah yeah my uh teammate jordan newman just got a huge win for bellator um i believe he's seven and oh now i think six or seven and oh with the promotion so this was his uh kind of first real big step up in competition and he smashed and really showed everyone that he's a pretty high level striker on top of a wrestler and yeah, trying to follow him in his footsteps, no doubt. I actually got to watch Jordan's fight compared to a lot of the other fights on that Bellator card. It was a pretty busy day for MMA that whole weekend. I mean, they had the A1 card on September 6th, September 7th. Then they had that card over there in Bellator in San Diego and Watching Jordan fight, I mean, uh, everyone was saying USA versus Russia, right? I think there's even some chance of USA going on in the crowd I that love day. That shit. <laughs> nice. It was, you know, and I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with it, being in the wrestling scene, you know, having that kind of dynamic. But can you kind of go into it like how it is as an American wrestler? To, you know, is do you as a fighter kind of play into that now that you're going into the MMA scene, or is it? Is it kind of all love, or can I know you said you, you're you're a big fan of the uh, of that uh, patriotism there? Yeah, I love it. I think uh, um, my take on it is there. There's been a lot of American wrestlers that have came into the sport of MMA that have been successful without using a ton of their wrestling. So I think like guys like um, you know, Tyrone Woodley, 
Michael Chandler, guys like that. It's like you don't think of them as a wrestler first because they are so well-rounded. Um, and frankly, we just haven't seen that many American high-level wrestlers, you know, make that transition to MMA. Whereas now there's definitely a big surge in that. And uh, yeah, I take pride in being, you know, from the best country in the world. I think, you know, we grew up wrestling. The biggest, you know, accomplishment we could get would be to represent our country, you know, at the Worlds or the Olympics. So we naturally kind of grow up with that, uh, you know, homeland pride in, in America. And, you know, just anytime you talk to anyone about wrestling in MMA, they think of the Russians right away. You know, and I think that constantly being like, you know, that stigma that, you know, if you're, you know, the Ru the Russians dominate wrestling in MMA and that alone kind of is a little unsettling because I just know that we're just as good or better than, than Russia every year. And uh, the big thing that I'm excited to see for the future of American wrestlers is that we're we're much much well rounded compared to them much more well well rounded i mean by far i mean even just my my training partner jordan's fight the guy took some really hard shots on him realized jordan wasn't going for it and it turned into a striking match and then jordan you know got had the advantage there so i'm really excited to uh yeah be a part of that movement and kind of reshape that narrative a little bit for sure and you're part of that team over there at Rufus Sport that has seen, I mean, the pedigree of strikers that have came out of that camp does not even need to be discussed. I mean, we've seen the Pettis brothers come out of there. We've seen so many talented athletes go through with, and it's so crazy because, you, you know, you often talk about California, you talk about the Floridas, you talk about even the New Yorks and Texas of the world, but you don't talk about Wisconsin being that MMA kind of hub but it's slowly there's slowly been gyms that have been popping up in that area i mean rufus sport has been a gym and then i mean overall just midwest mma has been kind of garnering a big push as well can you kind of go into that decision to want to go back to your original home state and get some work in with those guys over there at rufus sport yeah it was a uh um it was a tough decision let me see it's probably this is like a year and a few months ago to to move back to Wisconsin. Um, part of it, my little brother was starting his college career back here in the Milwaukee area for UW Parkside. Um, so that was big for me to be around for that. But yeah, man, my time at uh, at Rufus Sport was incredible. I love, uh, I love Coach Duke, Coach Cushman. Um, the way that they approach striking was very similar to the way that a lot of my high level wrestling coaches attacked wrestling. You know, they, uh, first off, they just love it at a high level. They're very passionate about it and they're super realistic. They're able to, you know, there's no sugarcoating anything. They're very serious about, um, you know, the standard that they want to set. And, uh, that's something that resonated with me a lot. And, uh, yeah, like you said, the, the list goes on and on of people that have been through Duke's gym. Um, and, you know, as, like I said, like as a, as a wrestler, I don't want to go into, you know, my career being just known as a wrestler that wrestles in MMA, you know, I want to be a full martial artist and uh, Duke loves working with wrestlers. He loves the, the mindset that we bring. And I think that's more so anything. The biggest advantage that wrestling gives us is that we understand how to train. We understand how to be coachable, um, all of those things. So um, that uh, that combo of of, you know, me desiring a high level striking coach and uh, Duke, you know, being there and being ready to, you know, give all the all the tips and all the coaching that he could to me. Um, it was great. I think uh, my striking improved a ton while I was there, especially training with with Jordan. That was a huge, huge advantage for me. I'm moving back to uh, to California now, so I'm excited about that. 
I love California. I think that's just it's just where I'm supposed to be. But um, anytime I'm home, I'm really glad that I have the opportunity to go back into Rufus Sport and, and make that kind of my Wisconsin gym, keep my Wisconsin roots for sure. Yeah, keep the keep the dairy in the roots, keep the cheese yeah. in the roots, you know, keep yeah. all the keep the yellow, keep the yellow in there. Something about yellow in uh in Wisconsin. Is it just a thing over there? Is it the cheese? Why why exactly is the infatuation with yellow? You got Green Bay over there is yellow, Rufus Sports yeah. yellow. I just noticed that. Can you kind of explain it to me a little bit? A oh, Wisconsin native yourself? I don't know. I don't know. We are we're the cheese state for sure. We're the cheese state, so that's probably a big part of it. But yeah, we always got the Packers you know, holding us down. Everybody knows about the Packers. Normally they don't like us because we're always beating them. But, yeah. I just don't like you guys because you stole my running back. I, I, I'm going to be honest. So no. I'm a Raiders fan, so you guys stole my running back. No longer got Josh Jacobs. You guys got Jordan Love over there. So always be cheering on the Packers in terms of, you know, they're just one of those original franchises. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't hate on them. The only team that maybe can is the Bears or other teams on the division. Vikings. You suck every year, so <laughs> they're irrelevant. Hey, but the Raiders took took my guy, uh, Devontae Adams, a Fresno State Bulldog, and a, and a big Packer guy. So hey, you, you guys you go. got one back on me for sure. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, now now it's uh, – I guess we can call it even there. All uh, even. All uh, even. As, <laughs> as the fans would say, man. That's actually kind of crazy. Devontae Adams, former Fresno State – uh, yep. I mean, Fresno State Bulldog. Then you got Derek Carr, another former Fresno State Bulldog, now is tearing it up over there in New Orleans. But let's talk a little bit about uh, – speaking about Fresno State, you just transitioned to the next question. Big news over there on their front, moving over there to the Pac-12. I know you were a part of that wrestling program when it did get dismissed, and that was a big bummer for the Central Valley. A lot of fans, a lot of people were attending those events. I believe they're some of the most highly sold sporting events over there for Fresno State at the time. Not only that, but – you guys had some stars on that team now looking back, some guys that are now going on to some green pastures and looking to go into possibly some MMA. I mean, Jace Luchow just made his debut over there at 559 Fights this past weekend. What are your thoughts about Fresno State joining that Pac-12 and the possibility maybe uh, maybe another program being thrown in there? I'm not saying wrestling, but you know, always that possibility of being thrown in there now that they're going to be joining a little bit of a bigger division. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, it, uh, I love seeing the school, um, get that opportunity. I think that's really, really big for the, the whole Valley. Um, I think, uh, that there's a lot of talent in, in the Valley across the board, whether it's, whether it's wrestling or you know, baseball, football, we had a ton of talent coming out of there and they were always very prideful in, in keeping our guys home. You know, we had a really, especially the wrestling team and we had, I want to say 75% of our team was from, from Fresno. Um, and as well as the other sports, everyone had a um, big motivation to, you know, support the Valley and, um, yeah, that big platform is is nothing but good for the, for the whole the whole program. And yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see the stars that we had on that team um, make that same transition that I'm doing over into MMA, just to really showcase you know the talent that we had because um, there was a lot, and um, you know there's not a lot of avenues. Um, for wrestlers to stay in the sport um, and keep their name out there. So the, the fact that we got so many of those Fresno State athletes that are um, those wrestlers that are making that transition to MMA, I think is, is super exciting. And they're going to keep hearing about all of us. So, yeah, I'm really excited to see where everybody else goes. Yeah, and with the addition of, I mean, uh, like how you said, that you guys are a little bit before that NIL kind of era, but now they're having the NIL be brought in. And, I mean, Sacramento State, they're doing some big things over there. Combat University, they're having, like, the first MMA program backed, actually, by the California State University system. So that's huge, obviously, booster and getting a lot of funds over there for that program. So there's a little bit more opportunities now that the sport of MMA is, is growing on the world. But it, like how you said, for a lot of you guys, when you guys were first uh, beginning those wrestling careers, it's so crazy now that a lot of those guys were maybe first beginning in 2020 to see how fast and how far MMA has now gone. 
but to speak a little bit more about actually your path and what you're looking to possibly be getting into in the future. Fighting Eye at the Tech, May 18, 2024, we were able to earn a split decision over Gavin Allen. And they just announced the return over there to the Tech CU Arena for December. Is there a possibility that we are going to see Huncho make his return on that card? Or is there a possibility that we may be seeing him a little bit sooner? Um, possibly, we'll see. Um, uh, that opportunity was, was given to me through my, through my, uh, my old management group with Radium. Um, and I've, I was going a different direction. I'm, I'm now signed with TNT. So we'll see. Maybe, um, I love the, I love the promotion. It was, it was a incredible promotion. Um, Scott Coker and, uh, Gilbert put on an incredible show. So. Yeah, I would love to go fight for them again. That would be really cool. Um, at this phase, you know, we're really just looking for the right, um, the right opportunity and the right matchup for the time. I'm still, you know, still uh, getting my feet wet, and you know, I don't want to rush into anything too crazy. So really, we're just taking taking it kind of month by month and waiting for you know the right matchups and the right situations so that I can continue to. Um, grow my comfortability in the cage, whether it's, you know, wrestling or striking or, you know, really just putting it all together. So um, we got a couple different opportunities lined up. So we should have a, I should have an announcement pretty soon here about, about where my next, my next fight's going to be. So excited for that. Are we staying in the state of California? Is there a possibility we're going a little bit domestic? You know, we're possibly uh, traveling in the U.S. a little bit. You know, we've had talks with a bunch of different promotions that really want me to fight for them. And uh, um, hopefully I can find a, uh, a good situation that's in California, you know, so that I can, um, you know, hopefully have some fans in the seats and, uh, um yeah, like I said, right now I'm, we're, we're keeping all opportunities on the table because um, where, wherever we got to go um, to get the right situation, and um, that's what that's what we're really focused on. And uh, um, the, the the plan is moving, you know, two or three local fights um, where I can get a you know a, a decent matchup and showcase my my striking and um my my abilities to be an all-around mma fighter and then uh from there move on to uh one of the bigger promotions most likely lfa or or fury or one of those um then at that point you know we'll be going wherever they can wherever they can find us a, a good fight you know you know they're all over the country so um i'd like to see lfa stop over in in wisconsin and milwaukee sometime that'd be pretty cool i've always thought about that um there's a Anthony Pettis has a really good show APFC that he's been putting on. It's been growing quite a bit, um, so that's another option that I might I might work into that organization. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're just you know waiting for the right opportunities and um, you know wanting to make sure that I'm comfortable in every at every stage. You know, I'm I'm only one and zero right now, so getting a couple. Um, a couple more fights under my belt before jumping into kind of one of those bigger pools. And then, uh, yeah, just trying to keep this thing rolling with, with getting good dominant wins. And, and the, the last of the nineties babies too. So I believe you're still 25 there, right? So, you know, it's still a lot of time to go ahead and determine a little bit more of that path of where you were wanting to go, whether it be LFA, Fury, APFC, so on and so forth. But speaking about LFA a little bit, you actually have a team of yours on that TNT sports management team over there, Jake Wood, uh, Jake Woodley. I mean, obviously, I would be remiss if I did not bring up that Oklahoma wrestling career. Very accomplished in his time over there. I believe a two-time All-American. How was it like to get to train with, I mean, a like-minded individual in terms of you guys are both from pretty pretty dang good wrestlers and now on top of that you guys are developing uh, developing the striking game as well yeah yeah that was uh jake's one of my best friends um when i was out in california we were living together and going through our first year of 
of training together. And uh, so being back in California with him has been huge. That's my guy. And uh, um, yeah, he actually uh, went to college with our manager, Justin Thomas. So they wrestled together at, at Oklahoma. Um, so now I really feel like I'm in a situation where I'm, I'm uh, surrounded by, you know, my really true core people where I have a lot of, a lot of faith and, and uh, confidence in them. And they have the, you know, same amount of confidence and, and, you know, desire to build me. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he went into, uh, his career went straight pro. So he's got, he's four and oh now, um, one and oh in the LFA circuit. We're back together training in California, working with, um, working with Antonio McKee over at a uh, body shop. And that's been incredible. He's got an incredible amount of knowledge and passion for the sport that um, really just clicked really well when we, when we started working together. Um, so we're super excited about the situation we're in and yeah, trying to follow in, you know, Jake's footsteps, get a couple more wins and then hop into the LFA circuit and, Jake and Jack start start taking the, the MMA world by storm, you know. A hundred percent. And I, I like uh possibly mentioning the likes of Bellator. I mean, Jordan Newman over there, you got Josh Hokett, another one of your teammates over there, uh TNT Sports Management. Any chance that we get to see you on one of those Bellator cards? I know they they love to hit the San Diego area. That's that's pretty near you over there in Orange County. Um maybe maybe the possibility of flying over there overseas. I know some fighters have their thoughts about going overseas and uh, taking about, but is there any chance we'd get to see you uh, fighting over there for the Bellator organization? Potentially. Um, we we kind of have the mindset right now. Um, uh, UFC is definitely our front runner. Um, we definitely want to have all our focus on making it to the UFC. That was always Duke's big thing. And, um, Antonio's got the same mindset that he wants. He thinks that we can be pretty big stars in the UFC. So that's definitely our first option. We had a, um, another one of our teammates that we trained with, Lazaro Daron, um, a Cuban wrestler that um, also had some ties to Oklahoma wrestling. And uh, he's him along with uh, Yuance Mejias. He... Uh, those two are both with us at, at Body Shop. So we got a pretty core group of guys that are that are uh, our wrestling guys that are, you know, we have a really close relationship through college wrestling that are all we're all trained together. Um, Lazaro just had his PFL debut um, against Danny Sabatello and sadly got a draw, which was due to the point, point yeah. getting taken from him. So he he put on an incredible show. His stock went up a ton. Um, he kind of was a little bit under the radar and and was a huge underdog going into that. And I think he really turned some heads there. Um, I mean, really, it's just about getting paid, right? I mean, that's why we all that's why we all you know started this journey in the first place is to you know use our our wrestling talents and our our training mindsets, you know, to translate in MMA to get paid. So. Um, the goal is the UFC for sure. It's kind of a UFC or bus type mindset to start. And, you know, if, if it starts looking like, you know, maybe Bellator, the PFL is a, a better route, um, for us to get paid, we'll see, you know, but, um, at this point, I, I definitely see myself getting to the UFC and, um, becoming a, becoming a big name in the UFC and, um, taking that route so that's the goal and that's what we're training for every day so well i'll just say i know the fight skills for the ufc are definitely pretty high caliber but if personality has any weighing into the ufc superstar potential you definitely got a whole lot of that my man one of the funniest fighters that we have always on the platform always a good time to get to speak to you my man and gain and work with some of the best gyms over there in california so not only a humorous guy but also a killer over there on those mats Anybody that you wanted to think in particular, I know you have a lot of people that help and really just donate some knowledge in terms to your MMA career. I mean, you got Tyler Wombles, Duck Rufus, OCRTC. You have so many 
I mean, gyms that have just been able to kind of contribute to you and I mean, sponsors as well. Anybody that you want to thank in particular in this segment? Yeah. Yeah, it's been cool, man. I think uh, uh, this is definitely, I mean, I would, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. This is such a good opportunity for myself to, you know, keep growing as an athlete and a martial artist. Um, and like you said, like when we're able to, in MMA, we're able to kind of bring our personalities into it a little bit more. And that's, that's been an absolute blast. I think that's a huge part of the game and I'm excited about that. Um, but I'd say my biggest, my biggest mentor at this point is Antonio McKee at my new gym. We really hit it off right away. And he's got um, a ton of confidence in me to get to that next level and be a star. Um, and he's not a guy that, uh, you know, he's, he's not going to sugarcoat anything. He's going to give it to you straight. And that's, that's the biggest thing that I've looked for in, in, in a coach. And, uh, He's really invested a ton of energy and time into me and Jake. And uh, um, I love the relationship that we have and and the knowledge that he's able to give us. I mean, he's, he's another guy that's had a ton of high level people go through his system. And uh, the amount that I see us improving every single week that, that we're training with him, um, I really mm -hmm. know that that's, that's my spot, so. I'm super excited to keep training under him, training alongside AJ, and uh, just kind of watching how how the best go about it, you know. So being around being around AJ is a, an incredible amount of motivation. He's a, a true champion in every every aspect. So um, being in that room and being alongside my guys Jake and Yuanse and Lazaro, I think. I really couldn't have chalked up a better a better situation for myself. Adrian McKee, the McKee family, I mean, overall, just MMA, I would say trailblazers over there, in Southern California area, really showing that you could just, you could, like how I said, blaze your own path. You know, they've really just kind of gone and ran with that team body shop name, and they've taken it on to a whole new life. I've gotten so many big names over there over the years. So big congratulations to them. And I mean, obviously being able to acquire the skills of guys like you and Jake Woodley to get into the gym, that's also a pretty good marker on their uh, gym going forward as well. Thank you so much for your time today, Jackson. Always a great pleasure in getting to speak with you. Before I get you off to the program, though, I got one question. Ilya Taporia, Max Holloway, they're going at it. UFC 308. Probably one of the most highly touted matchups that we have seen in recent UFC history in terms of Elia star power and Max Holloway's already just fan presence. Who do you have in that matchup? Who do you have taking it? Man, Ilya's a scary dude for sure. I mean, it was pretty wild watching him take care of Volkanovski the way he did. But um, I think Max kind of reminded a lot of people in his last fight with with uh, Justin Gaethje, um, I I want to. My gut says Max, but again, it's a it's a big toss up, and I think I want Max to win. So that's I'm I'm, I'm gonna go with Max, but um, you know that's gonna be probably one of the best fights we've seen in in quite a long time. So I'm super excited for that one. But I got I got the dog Max Holloway. He's I think he's gonna get it done. How about uh, that co-main event there too? I mean, Whitaker Chmaev, I feel like that's another, I, I feel like this event, like just the whole aura that has behind it. I know I hate that word now. It's been so played out in 2024 and this 2020, but man, it just, this card is really has that potential. I mean, you got Cyril Gaon, Alexander Volkov as well in the card. That's another, like a really, really good fight that I think a lot of people are not speaking on. But I mean, Whitaker Chmaev, that's going to be a fight that I think fans are going to look back at a couple years. It's going to be almost re relative to that Gilbert Burns and, uh, Chamaya fight that we witnessed a couple years ago. But I want to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, I think uh, I really like Chamaya. I think he's a guy that I got to give him his flowers because, like I was saying, like so a lot of these Russians are pretty one dimensional, I think, and they're they're super heavy grapplers. But Chamaya has definitely shown that you know he's just a straight fucking savage. And he's down just to scrap wherever it goes. And he's always, even if he is grappling, it's it's explosive and it's exciting. 
Um, but I think similar to the Max Holloway situation, I think the experience that Whitaker's got, um, I mean, he's just, he's just a road dog and he's taken, you know, every single, every single, uh, big, big fight and taking it on the chin and constantly been just that same, that same steady guy. That's, that's always taking care of business. I think, I think the time off that Shemayev's had is probably a benefit to Whitaker as well. Um, you know, staying active is definitely a, a big part of being ready for, for these big fights. So I don't know, not like you said, it's it's stacking up to be quite a quite a pretty gnarly card. So I'm excited to watch it, but I'd have I'd have to take Whitaker in that one too. Experience plays a long way in this MMA, MMA game and Huncho Hermauer is putting all of his money on those slots. And I think I'm going to have to go with them, too. I like Whitaker and Max Holloway in those matchups. I like how you said you got to go with your heart sometimes. And sometimes yeah. I think the heart wants what it wants. And the wise words of Selena Gomez. That's the way we're going to end off this call today, my man. Michael Hernandez of MLH Media. And we are going to be signing out over here in the 805 with my guy over there, Jackson Hermann. All righty, brother. You can go ahead. Hey, overall, great time getting to speak to Jack. Anytime I get to see him, whether it's out in the streets of San Jose whether it's over a video call, whether it's at 559 fights after he just won his welterweight championship. Always a great pleasure again to speak to Mr. Huncho Hermauer. Thank you so much for your time as always, my brother, and it is greatly appreciated. We now go into UFC Apex 98. Brandon Royval, Tatsuro Tyra. Man, that main event, let me just say, I feel like it's a little bit reminiscent of that Alex Perez matchup for Tatsuro Tyra. That's obviously, I mean, I would be I would be stupid if I didn't say that was one of the fights to watch for this one, but I I don't know. This is a true this is a true coin toss for me. I like Tatsuro in the sense that I know Brandon Royvel has had struggles with the grapplers over his time, but I really, really like Brandon Royvel on the feet in this one i know tatsuro had a little bit of trouble with alex perez in that first round on the feet and i think if alex perez is able to touch you up a little bit on the feet then brandon roy is going to do a little bit of something that you have never seen before so possibly i think he could be playing a little bit of upset here i know tatsuro's rated below roy val but i I think a lot of people are counting brandon roy val out just possibly looking at ufc's feeding tyra this you know obviously you know former tyra challenger and roy val but I just, I think, I, I think that Roy Val gets it done. That's truly what I do think. I think that Roy Val is able to get it done over there in Vegas, Apex 98. We're almost there at Apex 100. Absolutely crazy to think that they've had already 100 events over there go down at the Apex. You also have Daniel Rodriguez making his return on this card. Somebody that has been a longtime fan favorite. I mean, he fought Ian Gary a while back. He also got to fight Kev Calvin Gastelum over there in Saudi Arabia. Had the ish the multiple issues of weight and you know obviously had to deal with that whole situation so was able to get a new contract with the ufc now taking on alex morono most recently took on nico price who's also on this card to uh, also on this card on saturday i was going to say tonight like ufc apex 98 is here on a monday night but i think daniel rodriguez gets this one done i i really really think that daniel rodriguez has the edge in the striking i mean he was doing pretty well on the feet against kelvin gaslam and just i mean size just really came into factor i feel for kelvin and I, he was well overweight for that fight so that definitely does make a whole lot of sense in terms of why d-rod wasn't able to maybe be as efficient as he wanted to be but i think he gets this one done over alex give me d-rod i think that's going to be a fight to watch for sure Think that possibly could be the fight that you see D-Rod get a little bit back on trial because he's been having a little bit of a rough go as of late when it comes to his UFC opponents. So definitely going to be very excited to be watching that matchup. But then, I mean, there's just so many names on this card that I feel UFC fans are going to be recognizing. Chidi no Jokani, and you have CJ Vergara, you got Nico Price and Bembo Garimbo going at it. I mean, Nico Price just formally faced off against Alex Moreno. It's kind of weird. The UFC had a lot of the guys that faced off against each other or have fought each other previously on the same card together here, it looks like. And then, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the big boys, man. Chris Barnett and Junior Taffa. Oh, man, I, I, I mean, 
if you don't love Chris Barnett in the UFC, what are you doing? Like, I, I feel like that's just like, it's a given. I, I really like Chris Barnett in this one. Junior Toffa has had a lot of struggles against grapplers before, and Chris Barnett's are very, very prevalent in all of his realms of mixed martial arts. I mean, both of his parents are Taekwondo black belts, and then he was a collegiate wrestler, I believe. So I, I got Chris Barnett taking this one. I think Chris Barnett gets it done. I honestly see Junior Toffa kind of on his way out of the UFC. He hasn't really produced a whole lot of big wins in a while and he just i'm five and three now and if he loses this one he's five and four I really don't see the ufc keeping him around for it especially with the fact that his brother as well i mean i just i really don't see the ufc i, I kind of look at this as a make or break fight for junior Tafa. so that's also kind of why i'm highlighting it on my page here because i think Whenever it's these make or break fights for these guys, they usually tend to come out a little bit more reserved, a little bit more tightened up on their game plans. And just seeing Junior Toppa has not really been super tightened up in his game plans in these last couple of fights. I know he's been taking a lot of last second fights, been doing the UFC a lot of favors. So that may come into terms with it comes to contract negotiations, but I just don't think with the performances, there's any you know, there's any leeway on that one. But another big fight to watch on this card is you got Dan Argueta and Cody Haddon and then Clayton Carter. Clayton Carpenter and Lucas Rocha, a couple of Dana White Contender Series guys, and Cody Haddon and Lucas Rocha going and making, I believe, Lucas Rocha is going to be making his official UFC debut along with Haddon, taking on a couple of guys that are veterans in the UFC now with a couple of fights underneath their belt. I know Daniel Arguetta has multiple fights in the UFC underneath his belt. Clayton Carpenter being a little bit on the younger side, still has only one, but still able to get a win in that one, sitting at 7-0. I think that's kind of like... Like my buddy Tyler had said on uh, on his Instagram a little bit earlier from Mom's Basement, I think this is kind of the 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 the, wa the, the fight to watch out for this week. And Lucas Rocha and Clayton Carpenter, I think a lot of people may be looking at that 7-0 and and then look at that 17-1 and across from him, and it, it, it may be a little bit deceiving. I And, you know, I know looking on topology or possibly for the fans that do their research, they're going to be like, well, I mean, Lucas Rocha is going to steamroll this guy, but... You know, Clayton Carpenter is very, very talented in his own right. So I think that's why the odds are a little bit a, a little bit skewed in the way they are. But I definitely think that Lucas Rocha has the potential to possibly upset a lot of people's bank accounts that may not be looking into this one super deeply, especially considering that it's one of the first fights on the Apex card for this upcoming Saturday. So you know how oftentimes a lot of people, they just really, truly don't look too deep into the cards. But we... I now digress. I mean, there's like how I stated so many people on this card. Yeah, even co main event, you got Brad Tavares, Joan Young Park, Grant Dawson, Rafa Garcia in the future bout. And then our girl, Corey McKenna, over there in Sacramento, taking on Julia Palastri in her return to the cage. And, you know, got to give a big shout out to Corey McKenna. She's been going through a lot in terms of her training camps. And just, I mean, she's been a big part of helping raise that combat university program over there in Sacramento. So she's been up to a lot of big things in her time off. She sadly wasn't able to capture that win over Jacqueline Almarine. But I think this fight against Julia Palastri has potential to get her right back on track there. Julia has had a little bit of trouble with grapplers in her time. I mean, she just dropped that fight against Knudsen. Knudsen, obviously, huge grappler has has some power in that realm and i mean we all have seen Corey mckenna and her fights when she's able to bring it down to the ground that is truly where she is able to just buy bread and butter she is a brown belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu i believe pretty close to her black belt parents are former mixed martial artists as well so you know her grappling is very very on point i think Corey mckenna gets it done in this one i think that she possibly reignites a little bit of a fire over there in that 115 women's division but Hernandez here of MLH Media, MLH Uncensored, now signing off here for the second episode. Just wanted to go ahead and look into some fights coming up here on Saturday that possibly some fans that, you know, I know it can often be seen or made out by the other media that these that these fight nights, that these fights in between pay-per-views, that there's nobody on them. Oh my gosh, these fight cards are so terrible. But oftentimes, a lot of these people that you see on these pay-per-views often get thrown on these fight cards going forward. So it's always great just to be able to watch these and get to hear some of these names again and get to follow their careers and overall really really excited for this apex card on saturday i think it's going to be a very interesting one i'm actually excited because i'm going to be able to watch hopefully a good amount of it since i will have a little bit more of a you know 
a timestamp on it since it will not be a pay-per-view and it will be a apex card so very very happy that i will be able to watch the card and not be sitting at home or sitting at work might i add and just not being able to enjoy ufc so really appreciate all the support look forward to catching you all on the next one michael hernandez mlh media mlh uncensored signing out